Hello, and welcome to episode eight of the Broncast, the official Cal Poly Pomona Athletics podcast. I am your host, Tyler Lobey, the Assistant Athletics Director for Communications at CPP. This week's podcast is another special one as we feature the true celebrities and the unsung heroes of our athletics department, the Cal Poly Pomona Sports Performance staff. I sit down with Assistant Athletics Director for Sports Performance, Rum Malisarn, Assistant Athletic Trainers, Lauren Solis and Albert Torres, and Head Strength and Conditioning Coach, Chase Sanders. We discuss the transformation of the CPP Sports Performance Office during Rum's 20-year tenure on campus, how they work closely with the student athletes to make sure they are being taken care of both physically and mentally, what measures are being taken to keep everyone safe if and when we return to play. And we play a little trivia to wrap it up at the end, only to find out that someone watches a little too much television. Here it is, episode eight of the Broncast. Another special performance of a performance of the Broncast. And I say that because we are here with the sports performance department here on campus in our athletics department, uh, led by assistant athletics director, Rum Malasarn. Rum, go ahead and, and introduce yourselves, and then we'll get to the rest of your staff. Thanks, Tyler. Uh, my name is Rum Malisarn. I am the Assistant Athletics Director for Sports Performance, as Tyler said. Um, from Southern California, uh, mostly Arcadia, California, and uh, I've been at Cal Poly Pomona for a little bit over 20 years now. I was also a student at Cal Poly Pomona, graduating in 1997. Uh, my past... Uh, has kind of started on campus and ended back here on campus. So like I said, graduated in 97, went off, worked at a high school, uh, physical therapy clinics, went to grad school at Fresno State, and was fortunate enough to be called back by the athletics and the kinesiology department to come back and, and work and teach as well. Hi, yes, I am Lauren Salas, and I'm originally from Mesa, Arizona. I've been at Cal Poly now for two years going into my third, and I definitely have had a path to get here. I've been across the country, um, all over, did my undergrad at Nevada, master's at Arkansas. My, I interned and worked at South Carolina, was at U UCI for a few years, and now I'm at Cal Poly. Hi, so my name is Albert Torres. I'm also the assistant athletic trainer. Um, hometown, Southern California. I've been around living in Laverne, Pomona, graduated from Ballin Park High School. Um, as far as my path to Cal Poly, I did my undergrad at Cal State Fullerton, did my master's in athletic training at Azusa Pacific University. Uh, afterwards, I graduated. Um, I went to work at a local high school nearby uh, Cal Poly Mona called Diamond Ranch High School. Uh, now I'm here at Cal Poly. Awesome. Uh, my name is Chase Sanders. I'm the head strength and conditioning coach here at Cal Poly Pomona. Um, going into my fifth year, I think it's my fifth year Rum, uh, going in here and uh, I'm, again, I'm from Santa Maria, California. Uh, my path here is, again, nothing too complicated. It's the typical college strength and conditioning uh, route. Uh, I went and did my undergrad at Brigham Young University, Idaho. Uh, went on to do my master's at Southern Utah University. Uh, went to intern for a year at Weber State University. I was a grad assistant at Utah State for about a year and a half. And then a how I got to Cal Poly is my mentor at Weber State actually worked with Stephanie Duke when they were at Cal State Monterey. That's how I kind of got the plug in here at Cal Poly Pomona, and I've been here since. Spent most of your life in Utah. Correct. Very nice. <laughs> well, thanks for being here with me today. I'm very excited to have you guys uh, with me here on the broadcast. Uh, you guys are definitely the the unsung heroes of the department. You, you, you keep the student athletes on the field, on the court. And, uh, and I know that you guys spend more time with the student athletes than any other staff member in the athletic department. So um, I know the student athletes very much enjoy your company. And uh, so I'm glad to be able to highlight you guys today. Beginning with Rum, you've been on campus longer than anybody in this department uh what why have you stayed so long and and what has changed at cal poly pomona uh compared to when you were a student here uh so much uh 
I actually think about that probably fairly often, especially in the last five years. Our our staff and our department has grown so much. I can't even really comprehend that we're at this point now with with the staff and sitting here. Um, when as a student, we were we had one head athletic trainer, uh, we had one part time grad assistant and then a whole bunch of student volunteers and you know the the landscape of athletic training has changed a lot as students we we did a whole lot that probably we we shouldn't have done uh back in the time but it it, it did allow us to make decisions and problem solve and, and really kind of work under the fire and do all of those things uh the department itself um athletically was we had some good teams here and there, um, but it was very inconsistent across the board. Uh, all of the coaching staffs were small. The support staff and administration was relatively small. And, and over the last two decades, I, I, I've seen it grow and blossom and change. I mean, under the, the leadership of Brian Swanson, um, Stephanie Duke coming in and, you know, putting obviously her stamp and influence and, and she and Brian work really, really well together. Uh, but ex expanding all the coaching staffs, expanding the athletic training staff, adding a strength and conditioning coach. Uh, we've now partnered with the College of Agriculture and the Human Nutrition Department, working with them for our student athletes. We work very closely with counseling and psychological services to support our student athletes. We work with the Department of Kinesiology um, to also support our student athletes. So it it's been really fantastic to see our department grow and I think more importantly expand to other parts uh, of the campus and, and partner with like a lot of really quality people and a lot of quality students and um, you know, really create something that we we do our best to pattern after you know a really higher end larger budget program uh, on our campus and, and work with the resources that we have. Being here for 20 years, you have not only, you know, you've you spent a lot of time with all these student athletes, but now 20 years ago, all of those student athletes that you worked with are, uh, you know, have families and some of them are even growing up to be college age where you may even like see them come through our department. How has that been like seeing alumni from 20 years ago come back and, uh, you know, and see their kids and they're all grown up and how, what's that like when you see them? It's wild. <laughs> um, you know, and so we actually have a student on campus who is the daughter of a uh, friend I went to college with. It was actually at Mount Sac. And, and so that's kind of crazy to think about. Um, my son has, he actually just applied to Cal Poly Pomona last week, got his application in. We actually had his baby shower in the athletic training room uh, back in 2003. And now he's applying to potentially come, come to school here. Uh, but, you know, at our Hall of Fame events, at our alumni events, it's, it's so great to, to see all of them. And it's really kind of hard to wrap my head around the fact that they're in their their 30s and, and 40s and have families and are all grown up because when I, I see them, they all look fantastic. Um, you know, they're, to me, they're always kind of stuck in that uh, college student athlete phase. So to, to see them back with their families and everything is, is awesome. And to see them continue to stay connected to the campus. Lauren, you, you spend most of your professional career, mostly at the division one level. And then you come down here to Division Two. What is uh, besides the amount of staff at Division One colleges and Division Two? What's the biggest difference, and and why did you want to change it up and come to a Division Two school? So originally, early in my career, I really wanted to focus on that Division One professional athletics. Um, and work in that world. And once I got in there, it was great. I mean, you have everything at your fingertips. You have someone who does every single job for you. You really can just focus on athletic training per se, instead of having to um, sometimes 
assist with driving or figuring out where you're going to eat or different things along those lines. Um, but it's a lot. And I felt very separated from the rest of campus and from the rest of my staff. Um, when I was at South Carolina, I had my own athletic training room, which is great in a sense. One sport in there, it, it got crazy, but no, nowhere near as crazy it is now. Um, but it, it kind of lost for me that family vibe of getting to work with a staff and being able to really feel like you're making a difference with the athletes in all aspects of their life um, and being there for them and supporting them through their academics and getting them to the next level of whatever they want to do in their career, whether that is be a professional athlete or if it's just to be a parent or if it's to be an engineer, but being able to support them and help them achieve their dreams and goals um, inside the classroom, outside of athletics, anywhere and everywhere that they want. And I just really like that I know all the administration. Um, there isn't anyone that doesn't know my name or that I know their name and that I have such a connection with our smaller staff rather than an entire building full of people where there's people that show up to the athletics meeting I've never seen in my life and probably will never see again. That is one thing that kind of blows my mind. I've never been at a division one school where you look at a staff directory and there are 10, 20 people just in say the, the athletic training department. And then there's 20 people in just business and the 20 people in sports information and 20 people then in, I don't know, academics, you know, academic stuff. And uh, it blows my mind how many people are in a division one athletic department to just to make it run. I mean, that's, it's, it's wild to me. And, and it, yeah, it doesn't have that feeling of being like a family. I'm, I'm guessing. Right. Yeah. There's, there's people that will ask me, Oh, do you know, so-and-so they were at South Carolina at the same time as you. And I'm like, no, never heard of them before. Yeah. Oh, they were at Arkansas or, or Nevada. Well, Nevada was a little bit smaller, but at Arkansas or South Carolina, there's just, the staff is just astronomical with the, assistant coaches and the grad assistants, like you said, director of ops and business and all of those, it's just, it's endless, the amount of people that work in the department. Now, Albert, on the other side of it, you, you came from kind of the high school level. Uh, I know that you worked in the college ranks, um, but, but you came from, uh, was it Pomona uh, Recon? Down a wrench. Oh, okay. Um, what, what made you want to make the jump from high school to college? And obviously there's a bunch of differences, um, but you know, uh, but kind of touch on those other than maybe just the age level of the student athletes you work with. Right. So it's interesting because I spent about eight years at Diamond Ranch High School coaching as a head soccer coach there for the boys program. So I spent some time there, um, built my rapport with our staff, and as soon as I graduated, their after, our head athletic trainer at the time had ended up leaving to take another position, and she told me, hey, do you want to take this job? I know you've been coaching here for a long time. I know you've been working your butts off so you can become an athletic trainer, and I think this school would benefit you because you already know the students. You already know the staff. You know how things work here. Um, so I took it. Um, also, was the head also was the ROP instructor there. So I taught in the day and then was an athletic trainer in the evening. Um, but I think the most important thing that I did enjoy there was just how students were trying to figure out their lives um, because that's where they're at. They're trying to figure out where college is at. They're trying to figure out who the right people they can hang out with are. Um, so they're in their development stage. Um, so I did enjoy making a difference in student in kids' life because after that, they're either one, going to college or two, going to get a job and either way they're going to face a world where they're more they have to do it, deal with it more independently um so i felt that was something that really attracted me is helping athletes in that kind of perspective um but eventually i did feel like my athletic training skills were a little falling behind because it is a hectic hectic life working at the high school um just especially as a, as a teacher co-athletic trainer um, you know, you also have to grade papers by the time when you're done, like let's say football season's happening, right? I'm in there from seven thirty in the morning, finished teaching at two, two thirty, getting football prep 
for practice and all the other sports that are going on. And we had about 22 sports teams going on. Um, and it's just me. So I have that going on. And then when football season, well, football, football practice is done, that's not till like nine o'clock ish or so, 10 o'clock ish. And then whatever energy I have left, I have to go and grade papers and if, answer emails from parents. So over time, it just became where I, one, wasn't taking, taking care of myself anymore. And two, my skills to constantly research what's going on with athletic training and consider how I can improve my skills and all that stuff, it was taking a, it was taking a backdrop. Um, so this is where I made the decision to just go to Cal Poly so I can full solely focus on what I went to school for was become an athletic trainer. Um, and I think, you know, being here for two years, I, it's, I think it's really helped me grow as a professional and as a person. And I still get to make a difference in athletes' lives because, again, these are student athletes, right? They're trying to figure out what they're, what they're trying to do after college. So it's, it's a touch of all, all types of things that I, I still enjoy. I, being in, obviously, I went to high school at some point in my life. Um, and, but I never, I never played, I never played sports. I, I got, I played freshman year baseball, got cut sophomore year. And that's kind of how it landed me in my position is that I kind of enjoyed kind of being a part of the team by being a manager and doing stats and stuff like that. But I would also just see how busy the athletic training room would be in high school. And it was always just one person in there and then a bunch of students who wanted to, you know, help out and kind of go that athletic training path. And, uh, and I always thought that, that the athletic trainer at that time, of course, he, he taught some PE classes too. And he, he was always there. And I, and I thought, God, that does he ever go home? And, and then it was also really surprising when I would come to school maybe on a Saturday, you know, for practice or, or even like a couple hours after school, for whatever reason I was there, it was closed. I'm thinking, where is this guy? He should be here right now. But then again, you know, I know that you have a life. I mean, it's got to be an insane lifestyle doing all that. I mean, you have more than just 10 sports. You know, you're going to have a lot of sports to, to deal with in high school. Yeah, and that was, that was a tough part because I did have students as well. So my goal when entering that position was I knew it was going to be hectic. So how can I utilize my students to help me in a way where I can lessen the blow and for me to actually do athletic training related stuff? Um, so if, like, for example, one of the things I had my students do is one, control the traffic, right? So we had athlete actually students controlling the lines of students that are waiting to get into the athletic training clinic. Uh, and two, they were also taking histories for how they felt um, where were they were hurting day and stuff like that. So just basically all the questions. So when I got the paperwork, I was kind of being like a doctor in a way where I just read the paperwork right, right, right away. Any kind of relevant questions that I wanted to ask after, I would do during treatment, trying to handle what I already knew about the athlete. So I was just trying to get ahead of all the tra all the, the, the traffic that was going on in that clinic. Now, I'm, I'm going to throw out this name and, and you guys probably have seen the replay, maybe even saw it live. Dak Prescott, Dallas Cowboys quarterback. And I'm guessing you guys have seen it, seen what happened to him last week in a game. His ankle got turned one way when his body got turned another. You guys are the ones who immediately run out to the court, to the field when something like that happens. I... For me, I, I, that's when I know athletic training wouldn't be a job for me because I, I, I kind of have that like upheaval and don't, just don't want to see that. And then of course, you know, when there's, there, there's blood, there's other things that you see that's very undesirable. What, what is, what makes you want to do this? First of all, I mean, I, obviously there's uh, so many other things that, that are great about the job, but you know, the, the traumatic times that happened have got to be pretty traumatic, not just for the student athletes, but for you. And, and alongside that, what is the worst injury you guys have attended to? Uh, I'm gonna, one. <laughs> well, I'm going to jump in on that one because like you, I actually cannot, and my staff knows this 
I can't handle those videos and, and photos. It, it, it gives, probably gives me a very similar feeling you do. Uh, but live, I have zero issue with it. I actually, uh, unfortunately, had that same injury uh, working. I worked X Games for 10 years, and, and I, I saw that same injury with someone landing on a, on a half pipe and was there with the, with the surgeon when, you know, he had to, to manage that and we were all there. And, and when it's live, I don't have any issue with it. Adrenaline at all. You're just, I know. You're just on top. I, yeah, my brain goes to a good place. I, I'm I'm there to take care of the athlete in the situation, and and it's not. But but when when these guys love to send me a slow motion video or, or, or photo or something, just just to just to harass me, uh, that's it's it's tough for me to handle. But I I think you I think it it's true. I mean, a lot of people who are even in medical school will go and and they won't know at the time, but the first time they have to to draw blood or observe a surgery and all of that. And you think you're going to be okay. And then when it actually happens, your, your body and your brain let you know that this is probably not your thing. And um, you know, a lot of people probably change career paths at, at that point in dealing with it. So uh, for me live, I have zero, zero issue with it. Uh, my focus is it to, to take care of the athlete and um yeah, with with the X Games, probably worst, most gruesome injuries, if you will, are fractured femurs, dislocated ankles, you know, stuff like that for me. I'd say the the main um, perk of dealing with all these gruesome injuries or any sort of injury in general is just being able to be there from step one to seeing the athlete back on the field. So I think that a lot of times helps get through those times is that you know that you're going to see this person progress and be able to come back and be perhaps even stronger than when they started. Um, and being able to see that progression and be there the whole time makes seeing all those injuries and dealing with any of that worth it. Um, for me, I've been fairly fortunate to not see any too gruesome, like those kinds of um, things. I've, I've seen quite a few dislocations, but I did have a cheerleader who um, was thrown up in the air and was never caught, um, landed directly on her neck. And it wasn't necessarily gruesome, but it probably was one of the scariest moments. Um, but able to turn on, get over there, get to her, and, and go through the motions of what we learn and being able to get her off the field and get her to where she needs to be. Um, but that was probably the scariest thing I've seen just because she was quite high in the air when she landed um, directly with no one catching her. Albert, what about you? I love it. I personally love it. I love the adrenaline that you get when dealing with these kind of injuries. Um, aside from, from my full-time job, I also work on the side with jiu-jitsu. Um, so I do medical coverage for organizations called like IBJJF and other organizations that exist out there. Uh, and that's where I see all the all the cool injuries. I I've gotten ankle injuries. I've got dislocations. I've gotten elbow dislocations. I've gotten shoulder dislocations. Some fractures um, to that extreme, but also to the lowest extreme of just little kids crying because it's something really hurt. Um, but for me, it's when you get in that moment, you just zone in, and everything that exists aside from that patient, it it just you just block out. Like you're just in that zone, and you just handle business. Um, and some of the things that I love about it is the athletic training profession is also growing in terms of what they can use in the toolbox to handle these kind of emergency situations. So we're also incorporating how to do IVs uh, for dehydrated athletes, for example. Uh, we're also doing learning how to use suturing now. So all that is going into our, our tool bag. So that's more stuff that we can add on to handle these kind of emergency situations. So for me, it's, it's always something that makes me happy to do to, to get an athlete to go back from that situation to full blown now working with chase, um, in the strength in the strength room. Now that, that would, that's going to be a perfect segue into what I'm going to ask chase next, but just watching before I get there, just watching the Dodgers game last night and seeing Bellinger pop his shoulder out after he hit the home run and he, he pops it out just because he goes and, you know, does his, the arm thing with one of his teammates and, into the thought of somebody having to then pop his sh shoulder back in and then he's okay. It's, it's, it blows my mind. 
that 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 he's back out there on the field just because he you know his shoulder popped back in and and there's no damage to it it just blows my mind um and it just kind of makes me cringe once again and with uh jujitsu i mean people are kicked people are knocked out people are you know broken noses you know stuff like that i mean i i watched that and i know that obviously they wouldn't have that sport if it wasn't completely safe. I mean, but from the outside, it looks like that sport is extremely dangerous and, you know, could potentially kill people. And it's kind of speak to how, how safe that sport can be uh, if done right. Yeah. It's always when I'm working in those events where I have to know who's actually fighting. So if you got like white belts or some of those lower tier belts, uh, it's all eyes on head, head on a swivel looking at every single athlete because that's where the technique is actually not as good as compared to like black belts so is kind of where you, where you talk about as, you know, if it wasn't safe, then it wouldn't be done. But at the same time, technique also plays a huge role in how safe it can be. Um, so that's something I also consider. Now, Chase, you, I've, you've kind of sat out for the last 20 minutes, but uh, I, your job as a strength and condition coach is to really help the student athletes kind of strengthen their body so that they have less risk of being injured in practice, in games. Um, kind of talk through how you kind of became what you, uh, what you are now and, and how, how you enjoy uh, kind of seeing the student athletes kind of use what you have taught them, what you have kind of the strengths that you've given them um, to be successful on the field or, you know, on the court, whatnot. Yeah. So how I kind of got into the whole strength and conditioning thing was, and I've talked about this numerous times and these guys all know the stories. Basically I got sick, my junior senior year of high school, got cancer, went through all the chemotherapy, blah, 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 all that stuff. So how my body had changed, it, it was pretty eye-opening. So after I was done with being sick, again, I was trying to come back and play football again after a couple of years. So what had ended up happening was I met a gymnastics coach who just was like a family friend uh, at the school. And he's like, hey, I know you're just trying to come back. Um, I have this gymnastics studio. I have a small weight room in the back. If you want me to like train you, I can kind of help you try to get back onto the field and get a little bit more muscle on you, get you stronger again, blah, 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 blah. So fast forward, I ended up doing that for a couple of months. He kind of showed me the ins and outs and the very basics of strength and conditioning. Um, and I kind of just noticed changes in my body that I hadn't felt in a couple of years from where I, I was when I was sick to where I felt uh, going into playing football again. Uh, again, never got back to where I was and it's no excuse. I just wasn't that good. Honestly, I just wasn't that good. But um, when I kind of saw that, I thought it was really intriguing on um, what the human body is capable of. So when I originally went to school, I originally went to school to potentially be an oncologist because I wanted to be a cancer doctor with all my experiences, blah, 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 blah. Ended up stopping and then going the, strength and, the collegiate strength and conditioning route. And I had just had phenomenal mentors along the way who just showed me the – not – just basically showed me the right way to go about things. And it was really cool, especially like being on the football side for as long as I was to getting these freshmen that would be, again, they wouldn't even touch the field unless you were like a, you know, a big recruit that was going to play day one, but you have these newcomers and these guys who were going to run these girls who are a red shirt. And then you see them develop through their red shirt year. And you see them two, three, four years later, just become starters, become all Americans uh, taking their craft seriously, their sport seriously, strength and conditioning seriously, athletic training seriously. And it was just phenomenal to see the physical and mental changes that came along uh, with, with all that stuff. So just seeing the athletes able to evolve and see where they start from day one to when they do leave the university, I thought that was really intriguing. And it was something I was really passionate about and, and something I could see myself doing uh, my whole entire life. Now, I, I see some of the workouts you post on social media, um, and one in particular that I saw yesterday was one that you said about your wife that uh, you yelled at her 
to go faster, to go harder, and she didn't actually yell at you back for that. I'm sure that's a lot of a lot of fun over the dinner table when you uh that's a big win so again i i i always it's you in the strength country realm like you very like rarely like say you're gonna program or train your spouse but she came to me and asked me hey i want you to write my workout so it's like okay okay this is what you want to do here's the plan that we have in place go so again on saturdays like we don't work out with our friends. We don't do any of that. Like we just stay home and work out with each other because our work schedules are so chaotic. We only see each other on the weekends. So Saturday mornings are kind of like our mornings to, you know, kind of work out together and be together. So we did a workout on Saturday and I'm very careful of what I say to her in the middle of workouts, because if you know my wife, it's not, if I come at her in a certain way that she seems, uh, not nice even though it might be nice i'm gonna get hit with a flurry of words that are not appropriate for these airways so i was like hey babe go faster come on come on let's go and surprisingly she just looked at me gave me a thumbs up and kept going so there we are it wasn't too bad i've been around you for two and a half years three years however long i've been here you never have a you're never not upbeat what gets you up in the morning? What, I mean, is it, is it like 10 cups of coffee? What's your, what's your secret? Part of it. I want okay. to say 10, but the caffeine is definitely a big part of it. Okay. But no, man, I think it's just one of those things where you just, where you're, when you truly enjoy what you do, um, it's the whole cliche saying you never work a day in your life. And again, like in the grand scheme of things, literally, I, I when you look at my job, and I work with 18 to 22 year old college athletes in a weight room. It's not a bad gig. And especially with as passionate as I am about strength and conditioning and all this kind of stuff, like it's very easy for me to get up and do what I got to do. Now, in regards to the, the upbeat stuff, I, you have to be. Uh, because in the end, when your first team's at 6 a.m., uh, I can promise you, if you've been around our student athletes, more often than not, 99.9% .9 of them, aren't too thrilled to be there at 6 a.m. in the morning with my whistle blowing, me yelling, dancing, do what it is, what I need to do to get them going. Um, but they kind of feed off of it a little bit, all right? And, and when you realize not every athlete can enjoy being in the weight room, you're, they're going to feed off of your energy. It's the same thing if you go in the training room. Like at the training room, athletic trainers, everyone in there is upbeat on the ball because the athletes are going to feed off of our energy. And you don't know what a kid's going through. You don't know what a coach is going through. So, again, the kind of energy you put off is what you're going to receive. So, and especially when I work, again, all of us, like, I see every single kid every single day. I know every single student athlete's name. I have some kind of story with them. I know their backgrounds for the most part. Um, and that just, it just makes it exciting. And, it, and I always get the opposite end of it. Rom, Steph, Albert, Lauren, they will ask me if I'm not loud or yelling Every time it's like, dude, are you okay? Are you fine? And it's like, no, I swear I I'm good. It's just, you know, when you got to go through that many sessions and all that kind of stuff, it kind of wears on you. Sure. But again, just love, you know, doing what you love and, 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 you know, in the grand scheme of things, like I said, like I work with college athletes for a living in a weight room, get bigger, faster, stronger, more explosive. There's worse things in the world. So I can't complain. Absolutely. Um, switching gears a little bit, uh, and it'll be the last question before we kind of get into a little bit of fun here. Um, COVID-19, and I, I, I know that you guys know that was coming. Uh, Rum, you are on every committee known to man, whether it's COVID-19 related, whether it's not COVID-19 related, whether it's even athletic training related. I, you are on thousands of committees. Um, but specific to COVID and, and the return to play kind of stuff, what's, what have you guys been doing, um, you know, to prepare for a possible return to campus or return to play? Um, I, I know that there's a lot of planning involved because it doesn't just, there's no just snap of the finger saying, Hey, all right, we're good to come back to campus. Let's, let's, let's bring them back and, and just roll with the punches. I know that's not the case. 
what's what what kind of preparations and trainings are 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 being put in place uh for that day that it that someone says let's go let's get started yeah um definitely a lot of conversations definitely a lot of a lot of meetings and planning and coordinating with uh obviously the campus um our department outside of our department uh, making sure we're we're up to date with what's going on locally. Uh, being in LA County, our restrictions and our numbers are significantly different uh, than most of the country. I don't think people realize, and this number may be a little bit off, but the population of LA County is larger than the population of 43 or 44 other states. And I, I don't think people realize that when you talk about it and you say, well, why can't you guys do stuff? Um, I, I think it's really hard to wrap your head around how, how densely populated we are and, and how, how LA County works if you've really never been in the area. So that's been, been a, a huge challenge for us. Um, as far as planning, it's, you know, a lot of conversations with the NCAA, with uh, the California Department of Public Health, with our student health center, um, you know, we meet with the other CCA athletic trainers every week and talk about what they're doing all, you know, the, the 12 schools are all in different places um, in, in their ability to return to campus and their resources, um, working with Brian, Stephanie, Pam, the, the staff on screen right now uh, to make sure we have everything in place because the reality is no one person is going to be able to see every single aspect and every single part of what needs to be done in that. And that's everything from, you know, what, what Chase's plan is going to look like from indoor to outdoor to sanitation in between sessions and in between people, um, what personal protective equipment we need because we're going to be in close proximity to student athletes if they get hurt and things like that. How do we sanitize our use spaces, whether it's at an area as large as Kellogg Arena or the athletic training room, or the Bronco Performance Center, uh, equipment and laundry, and you know, and all the things that Sarah has to figure out. I think having gone through this process, if I were to take something positive away from all the negative things related to this pandemic, is it's allowed us to work really closely with other entities on campus, work in a different way with people in our department. Um, I think it's really highlighted how fantastic our campus is as a whole. I mean, we even, counseling and psychological services is part of making sure that they check in with our student athletes on a regular basis and our student athletes have access to them. Our student health center and the director, Rita O'Neill, has been awesome in getting information to us, helping work on testing protocols, finding out what we can do on campus, the campus leadership, you know, all the way up to, to President Coley. It's, it's been awesome. You know, it, it really shows. And I, I would love to think it's that way on every campus and for, for every group, but the reality is it isn't. Uh, so to have been able to, or to continue to go through this process and, and plan and have everything changed the following week and, and have to revamp those plans again. And we're probably on our fifth or sixth round of redos. Um, it's been challenging, but at the same time, because we want to do it for the student athletes in our department and, and everybody, it, it's not difficult to do because there's, there's a good carrot out there in our desire to safely bring our student athletes back when that's something that our campus is able to do. Well, it's safe to say that it won't be the same when we come back, no matter if there's a vaccine or not. I mean, this will be in all of these things will be in place for quite some time. And, um, and I know that you guys are all working very, very hard to make sure that when our student athletes come back, that it's going to be a safe place for them. And, uh, and so, you know, on behalf of all of, you know, the department, student athletes and, and other staff members, um, I, I thank all of you for what you guys are doing, because I know you're going to make it um, pretty awesome for when they come back, but also very, very safe and, and, uh, so that we don't have any issues. Um, anything else to add on that, Lauren or Albert or Chase, before we move on to um, some other things I've planned? Yeah, just real quick. I, I, it's through this pandemic, it's, 
it's just shown at least to me and I'm sure to the rest of the everyone on this call is like and you know you don't say this lightly but we have such an elite department and such an elite staff um we don't have a woe is me sports performance team uh you know just talking with other people things you're hearing everyone's playing oh woe is me we can't do this this that and the other well it's like look at the glass half full or half empty and this is a staff that looks at everything half full so and that's what has made it so fun um again we put plans together and as soon as we got a call rum's like put every single hole you possibly can in this plan and then go do it again. Okay. Do it again. Do it again. Do it again. Because we want to have plans for A, B, C, D. If things don't go our way, we have a plan in place. And that's just the expectation that Rum has on all of us. And the nice thing about having that expectation is Lauren, Albert, and myself, like we love it. We enjoy it. And that's, why whenever we do get back on campus like we're going to be ready to go because as a staff we've put in so much work on this so it's just fun and it's contagious to be around and it's going to be a real good time when we get back now into the fun stuff kind of the more personal questions i'm gonna go ahead and ask these questions and uh first thing comes to mind just go ahead and blurt it out uh we'll start with albert's and then I'll go with Lauren, and then Chase, and then Rum, okay? What is the last thing you guys watched on Netflix? The Office. Sister, sister. Sister, this, uh, sister, okay. New girl. Chef's table. Okay, all right. New girl's a good one too, I like that Chase, good one. If you could be on any reality TV show right now, what would it be? Uh, naked and Afraid, I guess. <laughs> I love that one. That's a good one. It would either be Amazing Race or The Bachelor. Okay. Honestly, like hard knocks. We need to have like a cow pipe amount of hard knocks when we get back. Let's do it. I could go with the hard knocks for basing race. I, I'm not I'm not a big uh, reality TV person, so I probably couldn't even name three or four. But but the uh, at least those those two I can get on board with. Knowing that Lauren wants to go on the the Bachelor, I think anybody can nominate anybody to be on that show. So I think we have to, uh, guys. We have a we have some we have a job to do when we get the hashtag going. going. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I think it's abc.com slash casting. Let's let's uh let's put Lauren's name in the in the in the mix and see what happens. <laughs> what was your first ever job? Uh worked at a recycling center in Long Beach. <laughs> Teaching dance and gymnastics and cheer to little Costco, and I got fired two weeks later for putting lemonade in a water cup. Hmm. I, I actually, very, very first job was weeding and watering my neighbor's lawn when I was nine years old. Okay. If you had to live in a different state, what state would that be? Hawaii, hands down. Funny enough, this changes for me all of the time. So today we'll go with um, Oregon. Okay. Easy, Rhode Island. I, I give New York a go. Okay. I, I've always told my wife, if I ever become homeless, I'm just gonna find a one-way ticket to Hawaii because you can just live on the beach and it's, you're never going to have to worry about being cold because it's, you know, it's always going to be at least 70 degrees. So you're going to be, you're not going to freeze to death. So that's, I like that one, Albert. I think the same thing. And I'll, I got me to ukulele too, so I'll take that too. We got music going. Yeah, exactly. If Would you rather be lost in the mountains or on an island? You know what, I'd probably say the mountains, more to do. <laughs> The mountains in Hawaii, how about that? <laughs> there we go, there, good answer. 
I would take the mountains. Same, mountains, more to do. Yeah, survival wise, I, I would say mountains, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with the beach and take my board with me. Toilet paper, over or under? Over. Over, and if I'm at your house and it's under, I'll change it. I'm gonna completely disagree with Lauren. It's always under. This is a debate we can have later. Over, definitely hey, over. What does your wife say, Chase? She doesn't care, just as long as there's toilet paper. <laughs> okay, right. that's fair. Would you rather be rich or have the superhero power to fly? So would you rather be rich or fly? I'd rather fly. Rich, I can fly in my private jet. Honestly, I'm a girl more and I'm gonna go rich just for that reason. I'm gonna say fly just because I'm already rich. <laughs> With love from my staff. <laughs> That's good. McDonald's or Noodles and Company in Pittsburgh? No, just kidding. I'm not going to No. <laughs> Inside joke. <laughs> okay, moving on. Now, for this to work, I'm, gonna, I'm trying something new here. So for those people who have watched every other episode of the Broncast, uh, I've not done this yet. I'm going to try it out. It may completely fail, and I expect it to completely fail, but, you know, might as well give it a shot, okay? Um, this is a competition between all four of you, okay? I'm going to keep score, and the winner, I will Venmo some money to you guys. And not a lot, I promise you that. It's not very much, but that's, that's the prize, and I'll tell you how much it is later because there's some significance to it, and I, I, I will explain that later. I heard, but, you promised, I heard you promised Mitch Cox a million dollars, so I mean, <laughs> I'm expecting something close to that. A million and one dollar. Yes. <laughs> and two at one and point. Not even close. It won't even be close to that because I already gave him a million and one. So I'm a little broke now. Um, although he didn't answer my question, I still had to pay him. It was the contract. It was written wrong. It, all bad news. So it definitely won't be a million dollars. Um, so for this to work, uh, I, what I, I know that all of you are muted right now. Go ahead and unmute your uh, microphones. What you're going to do is I'm going to answer a question or ask a question. You are not going to answer until I finish saying the question one. And when you, uh, when you think you know the answer, I want you to raise your hand and say your name at the same time. And there's, there's a reason to that. Um, I won't <laughs> explain it, but I want you to scream your name and put your hand in the air. And of course, the first person to uh, do that, then they can answer the question. If you get it wrong, then, I'll, you know, same question goes to, for anyone else. Um, if no one gets it, then we move on to the next question. These questions deal with uh, maybe a character of a show. All, all of it has to do with television, okay? <laughs> I'm going to ask a question, and I'm looking for the network, that that TV show was on at that point, okay? I'm not necessarily looking for the name of the show, but the network. So it kind of will take a little bit of thought before you answer, okay? That makes sense? Everybody clear on what, mm -hmm. what you're gonna do? Okay, all right. Angelica Pickles and Doug Funny. Lauren. Lauren. Nickelodeon. Very good, very good. I just watched Doug like two days ago. <laughs> we got we to get back on campus and start working. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of the longest running medical dramas based out of Seattle. Chase. Chase. What channel? ABC. There you go. Grey's Anatomy on <laughs> ABC. Good work. Carson Daly became well known Chase. here. Chase. Lauren. Chase, you have he to wait until I'm done. Yeah, he didn't. So, <laughs> go ahead. I'm done. MTV. MTV, correct. Yes. He was an MVJ. I wish they would still play music on that. Same. Yeah. I missed TRL. All right. Two for Lauren. Chip and Joanna Gaines. Lauren. Lauren. 
HGTV. Uh, come on. You've never seen Chip and Joanna Gaines from Texas? Yeah. I have. Oh my gosh. Lauren's going to run away with this. What channel would you turn on to most likely find a Law and Order Special Victims Unit marathon? Chase. Chase. USA. Good. Very good. Come on, Albert and Rum. <laughs> Downfall of not having cable TV or anything like that at the house. This is. I don't have cable. These these shows, not today. I mean, these shows happened a long time ago. You should have had cable way back when. <laughs> oh, come on. Oh. <laughs> I believe him too. Joey Tribbiani. Lauren. Lauren. NBC. Very good. Yes. Friends originally was on NBC. All right. Just, you know, for the sake of this, Lauren and Chase, okay. you're not you're not on this next question. Let's see if, if Rum or Albert can get this. The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson. Rum. Rum. NBC. Very good. Yes, Rum. That's one. Yeah. Okay. Wow. You just right. needed to go back 50 years. That's it. That's <laughs> All right. Chase and Lauren, you're out of this too, okay? Bart Simpson. Albert. Albert. Fox. Very good. All right. Yeah. There you go. Everyone's on the board one. Okay. Stuart Scott. Lauren. Ooh, man, that was a high score. Let's go, Chase. Chase, ESPN. Very good. It was so me, but it's fine. Oh, it was it was a complete tie. And since Chase was behind you, you know, we you know we gotta give him there it a, is. A point. Uh Shark Week. Lauren. Lauren. Discovery. Man, you watch too much television. I do. You don't know this. <laughs> Puppy Dog Pals. Albert? Albert. The Animal Channel? No. Lauren. We'll go like Nickelodeon? No. No. Puppy Dog Pals. Disney Channel. Very good. All right. Let's go. <laughs> what channel is known for featuring a month-long schedule of original Christmas movies? Sometimes Lauren. Almost all year round. Lauren. Okay. Lauren. Hallmark. Okay. Very good. Yeah. What channel did Conan O'Brien go to after his departure from NBC? Chase. Chase? TBS? Very good. <laughs> wow. This is a two horse race here. Two horse race. Okay. Let's go, Albert and Rum. <laughs> Where in the world is Matt Lauer? <laughs> Lauren. Lauren. He's not existed anymore, but oh, NBC. No. Yes, correct. <laughs> On the Today Show. Walter yes. White and Jesse Pinkman. Lauren. Lauren. AMC? Wow. Wow. Ooh, I thought it was FX. Ugh. I don't I even know. That was <laughs> I've never heard those names. They're from uh, Breaking Bad. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, they're the characters from Breaking Bad. I, this is actually really embarrassing. <laughs> so you guys I feel like, I feel like even Tyler's <laughs> like, okay now. <laughs> I mean, I, AMC, I mean, people watch that on Netflix these days. I mean, who remembered that was on AMC way back when? I know a lot of useless trivia. Let me, like, Gosh. I feel like Lauren spent her childhood reading the, the TV guide. <laughs> yes, actually. <laughs> All right, House of Cards. Lauren. Okay. Netflix. Good. Okay, very good. Okay, I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> I only have one question left, so might as well. Might Katie as well Tanner, Jesse Katsopoulos, and Joey Gladstone. I know you know those, Lauren, but... I actually don't know the network, but I know the show. I know the show. Wow, I didn't know this one was going to stump people. Danny Tanner, Jesse Katopoulos, and Joey Gladstone. Oh, I'll go rum, and I'll no. just say NBC. <laughs> ABC is what it was. I don't like, on a major network. It was. Full House? TGIF. USA? It was on TGIF on... T oh, yeah. On on this world and all and Rum already said ABC. Yes. Yeah. So, yes, it got started at ABC. All right. Well, Lauren won that one. So, 
So I'm going to I'm going to be Venmoing you a dollar fifty. Okay, that is six quarters, and that is how many weeks it took for the Atlanta Falcons to get a victory. <laughs> yes. Congratulations to the Atlanta Falcons. This is what happens. See, the Seahawks have a nice little undefeated record right now. They win a Super Bowl recently. Tyler's feeling himself a little bit. He has the cap of my team that's one and five and just fired our coach and our gym. Hey, you know what, Tyler? Mm, that's sneaky. Two, we have a two-game lead in the NFC West. Yeah. Number one seed right now in the, the NFC because the Packers – Shit, dude, we don't need to talk about that. They, We're just lost, gonna they had a very, very good game yesterday for the first five, six minutes of the game. and then We're going to pretend like that game just doesn't exist. So Packers, The, the Miami Dolphins okay. are rolling. Don't, don't let that sneak <laughs> by. They beat the almighty Jets yesterday. Yes, they did. Oh, Keto Tyler, Russell Wilson is the best football player in the world. Thank you. In the world, Thank like you. the best football player. Would you give him an MVP vote? Oh, yeah, unanimous. Thank right you. now, this part of the season, unanimous. Not even close. Yes. Thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> let's, let's, I'll have you speak with the national media now. <laughs> All right, final question. What are you guys doing on November 3rd? Voting. 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 Very good. Do it. Right. Probably going to vote before then. So I probably will just be chilling. But I think we're doing it tonight. But get out there. Vote. That's yes. right. Voting. Correct. Nope. Well, that was it. That's the, that's the episode of the broadcast and the first winner of our, whatever I'm going to call this TV trivia battle, Lauren, congratulations, dollar 50 coming your way yeah. uh, soon. Don't tell I Jenny, think. don't tell Jenny Heimstead in our compliance office. I may have to report that for a violation. <laughs> yeah. So let's just uh, make sure she doesn't see this. I feel like we should take all the winners at the end and then compete again. Uh, let's do see, it. She, she's all about this. I'm done. Let's, I'm going to do my studying up. Let's yeah. do it. Yeah. And it won't be TV trivia so that there's at least some kind of, I'll, I'll come up with a different topic, but okay. uh, I was good. I, I was very much impressed. Assistant AD for sports performance for Ron Malasarn, assistant athletic trainers, Lauren Salas and Albert Torres and strength and conditioning head coach, Chase Sanders. Thanks for being with me today. You athletes, we miss you. Looking forward to seeing you guys all soon. Ditto. Ditto. <laughs> Thank you, Tyler. Right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thanks Tyler. Tyler. That'll do it for episode eight of the Broncast. I want to thank our sports performance staff for joining me today. For new episodes of the Broncast each week, make sure to visit our website at broncoathletics.com slash podcasts and follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at our handle CPP Broncos. Weekly podcasts are also available for free download on Spotify, Apple, Stitcher, TuneIn, and iHeartRadio. For everyone in the CPP Department of Intercollegiate Athletics, I'm Tyler Lobey, encouraging you to make it a great day, reminding you that Black Lives Matter, and be sure to rock the vote on November 3rd. As always, go green, go gold, go Broncos. Mm-hmm.